The idea for Naked Wines came when uh, 12 of us decided to leave our previous job and set up a new company. We did this in the middle of a recession, 2008. Lehman's had just gone bust. And um, we'd been running a wine company. And we sat under a tree in my garden one sunny summer's day with a blank sheet of paper and pencils and said, what are we going to do that's going to be better and different? And um, what we decided we, we needed to do was to come up with a completely new type of business. Uh, traditional wine companies, tra sorry, traditional wine retailers like supermarkets use their buying power, their bulk, to squeeze great prices out of suppliers. We had to do exactly the reverse. We get our prices by being nice to our suppliers, by literally we invest in them. We give them money to buy grapes, buy bottles, buy barrels, and in exchange they give us great prices. And, and that was the thing, that was the big insight that, uh, that helped us get going. Everything is different in the sense of customers pay for the wine before they get it, and suppliers get paid for the wine before they ship it. <laughs> As the suppliers had to get used to the idea that they were selling wine at a lower price, but they would actually make more money because so much cost has been stripped out because they don't need to waste money selling. So it was just a case we had to convince two, both parties to do business a different way. And the, kind of the, the moment the gong went off was when we started describing it as a virtuous circle. Uh, the customers invest money with us. We invest that in the winemakers, the winemakers give us preferential prices, we pass those back to the customers. Everybody benefits along the way. As soon as we identified that virtuous circle, it's a simple way to explain it, everyone gets it. Off we went. The two things everyone should know about most of the money they spend on wine. The first is wine companies, wine retailers are glorified tax collection agencies. So there's 20% VAT and there's two pounds a bottle. It doesn't matter if it's a bottle of one pound supermarket plonk or 5,000 pound 1962 Chateau Lafitte. Doesn't matter, two quid. So if you're buying a bottle of wine for 2.99, knock off 20% VAT, knock off two pounds, there, there is almost nothing in there. <laughs> there's no money for wine. The second thing you need to know is that for most wines, wine companies have to spend as much money selling as they do making. And that means that 50% of the money you're actually spending on wine is wasted. You can't taste it, you can't taste sales, you can't taste marketing, you can't taste storage, finance, bad debts, logistics, any of these things. There are only two things you can taste, grapes and the winemaker's talent. So what we try and do is strip out that dead cost and we, that means we can put more money into the grapes, more money into the winemaker talent, and that's how we land up with better wine for less money. The vast majority of producers didn't get it straight away. We worked with a handful of people where we had good connections. Even then, in many cases, to get going, we just had to say, all right, look, never mind. <laughs> Let's do business the normal way, but you'll get it. The, I, th I think the turning point was after the first vintage when we went back to people and said, you know, they're used to being told, no, you know, we don't want to list you anymore and we want lower price. When we could go back to people and say, we want to ship this wine again and this time we want five times as much. Then we got all their attention. And as soon as you get a few respected producers in the region working with you, all the other producers take a look and go, well, you know, if the smart guy is doing it, maybe I should do it too. And that was like a damn wall. Once, once that wall broke, we now have uh, a huge surplus of producers calling us rather than the other way around. I'd say the majority are maintaining a lofty disdain and looking down their noses at us. Uh, a few have played really dirty, calling up our suppliers and saying, these guys are going bankrupt, don't do business with them. Uh, one of them, at least, makes a, a habit of posting on every blog where we mention, saying, Naked Wines is a complete fraud. These are supermarket wines dressed up as something else. They're a bunch of crooks. Don't do business with them. So uh, there's a bit of everything. <laughs> but it doesn't stop them all calling up to say, would you like to buy some wine from us? <laughs>
Well, the first time uh, this, this, well, there's one particular person who comments in every blog and goes by the name of Annie or Sally or half a dozen different names. And the first time it happened, we thought, ooh, what do we do now? But almost before we could react, our customers found this and were reacted so furiously that the next moment this person was claiming it was our PR company, which we don't have a PR company, or we didn't then, um, claiming it was Naked Wine staff, but actually it was just a group of customers who were sufficiently irritated by what this person had said that they went back and said, look, these wines aren't fakes. I was at the tasting where you know, these wines were selected. I picked them. They can't be fakes. I met the winemaker. You know, it's, uh, th This thing is real. So I think in the end, it's really backfired on whoever this person is because it's, it's led to a feeling amongst our customers that um, you know, they need to help us and defend us almost. And certainly with the winemakers... Uh, seeing the rest of the trade having a bit of a go at us, I think has made them more inclined to work with us and support us. Because they're so used to getting beaten up by supermarkets. We have a saying, don't debate prototype. So, you know, most companies waste so much time sitting around in meeting rooms talking shit. And it looks like work, and it sounds like work, and it feels like work. And the wonderful thing about it is nobody leaves with any responsibilities, but it looks like everybody's been doing work. And it's terribly destructive. And it takes good ideas and waters them down to the point where they bear no resemblance to the original idea. Our thing is, if someone believes in an idea, prototype it. If you can prototype it, we'll put it in front of customers. If customers like it, we'll build it. If it works, we keep it. If it doesn't work, we junk it. And we have learned so many things which are the opposite of conventional wisdom. You know, everybody, uh, classic thing, you know, do you like red wine or white wine? Give people the choice. People hate choice. They like to be told, buy this wine. It is absolutely brilliant. And obviously, the small percentage who will only ever drink white wine or will only ever drink red wine won't buy it. But you still sell more wine that way than saying, here's a nice one, and here's another nice one. Which one do you want? The key thing about setting up a business like this is it's a very low margin business. Our, our margin's in the low 20%. And um, what that means is when you start the business, you, you go through the valley of death. Your fixed costs are fixed. Your variable costs are fixed. Your product price is too high. Most of your customer acquisition fails. Most of your early customers are trite. Everything goes wrong. So you burn money at a terrifying rate. But if you set the prices at a point where that balances out, you will always be a tiny business. If you want to be a big business, you have to set the prices at a point where you're beating the competition. And that means you're going to burn a chunk of cash. We knew that beforehand. So we went to a German family company uh, who, they 400 million euro turnover business, uh, who are in the wine business and have tried all kinds of different models in all kinds of different countries and we brought them in. And that meant we had the funding to go through the valley of death and out the other side. And also they have a very strong balance sheet and they've used that to guarantee our suppliers, for example, which means we get decent prices and we get credit from people. So it really made sense for us to bring in a third party. It couldn't be a VC because we needed someone with a balance sheet. And I have to say the thing about Germans is they do what they say. So they're long-term investors. They are very arm's length. Let us to get on with it. And, um, you know, they like the results as, as much as we do. So they've been keen to back us each further step along the way. The first business I was involved in setting up was Virgin Money, um, which was just an amazing stroke of luck. I happened to meet Richard Branson. He phoned up out the blue and said, do you want a job? And the first day I arrived at work, we, we were discussing, well, what should Virgin do? And we were talking about, you know, nightclubs and spaceships and boutique hotels. And 
that sort of thing. And I went, uh, what about financial services? <laughs> and, and we landed up doing it. And um, I landed up working very closely with a lady called Jane Ann Guardia, who came from Norwich Union, brought a team of people along. And we launched a business, got regulatory approval, built an IT system, marketing campaign, hired 100 odd staff, uh, all in 10 weeks. Trust your instincts. And the amazing thing about Richard is um, he didn't finish school, he didn't go to uni, and he always says he never had his instincts educated out of him. And he just had this belief it can be done. And most people, you know, give up. And Richard just has this belief, yep, we can launch an airline. You know, who else does that? And, and working for him, you think, holy cow, we can launch an airline. <laughs> And we can launch a, a bank, we can launch a financial services company. So, you know, he, the belief you can do it, and then if you believe in something, trust your instincts, ignore the research, ignore the commentators, go with what you believe. My top tips for starting a new business would, would be these. The first is, Grasp your, grab your luck. You will get some luck, but you have to recognise and absolutely go for it. Uh, my luck was meeting a bloke called Richard Branson, and I've never looked back since then. The second is only ever work with a tiny number of very good people, because even mediocre people actually create more work than they absorb. And getting rid of everybody except the exceptional people, things go faster. The third is 2.0 or nothing. And the wonderful thing about the world we live in is you no longer need huge amounts of capital, you no longer need a huge balance sheet, but you do need talent. And people with talent can uh, prosper without all of the, the toys that companies needed 20 years ago. But you've got to be imaginative, you've got to grasp the social media world we live in and make, it, make yourself a part of it. And the final one is, is prepare for the valley of death because when you launch the business, your most pessimistic predictions will prove to be optimistic and capitalise yourself so that when things are really grim, you can keep powering through in the expectation that they'll get better. <laughs>